All right, and I set it up to automatically record while it's streaming. Let's see, how are we doing? Can somebody let us know if we're actually live on the Twitch? And then we'll continue. Yep. Okay. Ah, nobody's there. Cool. I'm there. That's the only thing that matters. Okay. Sweet. All right. So as you all know, of course, because you're following along with the course, the assembly crash course is due Friday at midnight. Uh, we'll launch another module after that. Uh, Due date TBD, I'm going to see kind of how this goes. Um, I want you to have enough time, but now we're going to put, so you've been learning assembly. After this, you're going to be putting that knowledge in action and actually writing programs that do things instead of just moving data around, right? We talked about we want our assembly programs to actually do things. Before I do that, let's do what people were asking before class. We can do, let's say, 20 minutes of uh, maybe talking through one of the levels. I actually don't want to solve it all the way like I did last time, but... Um, how to approach some of them. Anybody have a favorite level that is in the teens that they would like to? Yeah. Maybe level six. Level six? All right. Register sizes. What are the sizes of registers? 16, 32, 64. There's one more. Eight. Eight. Yeah, eight bit size registers. What, uh, before we even tackle that, we should remember the slides on registers. And let's just queue up. Uh, oh, there we go. Cool. So this, if we're talking about uh, register sizes, that's before even looking at the level or what it's asking for, we have the slides on all the partial access to all the different registers, right, in this. Cool. Let's just keep that in our back pocket. Actually, let's go there. And then we can go. Okay. Can, everybody, can you read that in the back? The text, at least on the left. Cool. Challenge run. Let me wait. Okay. Uh, the interactions instructions, which you already know about because we talked about them. For this level, we'll be working with registers. Yay. Uh, you will now set some values in memory dynamically. Oh, we will. So the challenge is going to set values in memory. On each run, the values will change. Why does it do this? You don't think as you're reading these, why? Why does it do this? Why is it changing the values in the registers before it runs our code? Yeah, so we can't hard code the answer and say, well, the thing told me it's expecting 10 here, so I'm just going to move 10 in there rather than actually doing what the assignment says. Cool. Uh, da, da, da. We will tell you which registers to set beforehand and where you should put the results. In most cases, it's going to be our friend RAX. Okay, we have some background knowledge, but we've actually already got all of this from the, uh, from the chat we've been having in the slides. So we already know. We just talked about, right? Register sizes for the RIX register, referring to the all 64 bits is RIX, the lower 32 bits is EAX, the lower 16 bits is AX, and of that, the upper eight bits of AX is AH, and the lower eight bits of AX is AL. Cool, okay, so it says, using only the following instructions, move. We only have one instruction to use, cool. Please compute the following. R, set RAX to be RDI modulo 256, RBX as RDI module modulo 65536, and we'll set the values, so it's telling you what values we'll set. Send it some A's. Error, it did not like all of my A's, that's fine because that's nothing in there. Cool. Okay, so what's it asking us to do? What's the uh, modulo operation for assembly? Yeah. Remainder. Remainder. Can we use it? Uh, not as an instruction. You have to use uh, move 
Yeah, we can only use move. So actually it doesn't matter. Maybe there's the exact instruction that we can specify exactly how much module to do, but we only have move, yeah. Well, I thought the idea is you use div and then div, you'll end up with a quotient. Let's sure. Say RAX can we use div? Well, in this case, no. Correct, then we can't use div. We can only use move. So I must mean there's some way to do this without using div. Move the lower bits to each other. Move the lower bits to each other, why? So one thing to do is always look at this and do it by hand, right? If we can't actually do this math on our own without writing a program to do it, it's gonna be really difficult for us to write a program that can do it. So we have RDI is hex D967, and we have the task of compute RDI modulo 256. So someone remind us what's the modulo operator mean basically? It's the remainder left after division. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. Uh, so let's use our handy calculator. Let me quit out of all this stuff to reduce the possibility of things popping up. Uh, 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 sure, that's good enough. OK. So we have, how do I even do mod on this calculator? It's a great question. Let's use Python. Uh, IPython is interactive Python, so I can type in Python expressions here, and it will show me the output. I can do do a classic Hello World program. This is just a nice way to kind of interact with Python when I can do things without needing to uh, uh, use a calculator. There's a lot of stuff you can do on here. Okay, so in Python and in, I believe, most programming languages, right, C, C++, and Java, What's the modulo operator? Percent. So I do percent, then what? Two fifty-six. Thank you. Okay. So I need the result to be a hundred and three. So. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So looking at that number, it's actually hex 67. How's that in relation to our original number? It's, it's the close, yeah, lower one byte, right? Two hexadecimal digits are one byte. So it's the lower two bytes, why? That seems like magic. Yeah. Yeah, 256 is 2 to the 8th power. So we can actually, just looking at this, lob off. The only digits uh, we care about here is going to be the last digits here. Right, of this 67. So I guess, is this universal? How would we test this, our theory out? Try some more mods, see what they do. Uh, 10, 97, 67. That's 103, 12. I think we can keep going. Boom, right? So this is only, the modulo here is actually like a little shortcut where it's actually just the last it's essentially only keeping the lower eight, uh, eight bits here when we do the mod operation. So if that's what we want to do, so let's, um, what do I have? I'm going to use Emacs now. Uh, cool. OK, so let's say, so what is it, RDI? So I don't know, let's just move into RDI hex 10. Boom, run it. I guess I should be showing you the cool things of uh, Emacs while I'm doing this, huh? To make the uh, Vim people mad. 
Okay. Okay. So we moved 10 into RDI. Was this going to give me the flag? No. Why? Yeah, because A, I need to set RAX. I changed RDI, but I didn't change RAX. The, the, we have to remember to keep the description in mind. So, but what I'm doing this is showing that we failed in the following way. So RAX was expected to be F9, and we can actually look and verify if RAX was F9 and we kind of derived for ourselves that, hey, modulo 256 is the last eight bits, then that double checks. And then if we pass this check, we should not see this again. We shouldn't see that it failed because of RAX. So. What's our goal with the code here? We want to set RAX to what? To the remainder. Uh, let's do your e show. That's annoying. Uh, to, 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 to. I don't usually work like this, but there we go. Okay, where was my freaking copy, paste? Okay, so we know this shouldn't work. So my target register is RAX. What I want to move from RDI. I want to move the last what bits? The lower, the lower byte. Yeah, eight bits. We look at our handy table here and we say, okay, Mr. RDI, if I wanted to refer to your lower bits, that is DIL. So move DIL into RAX. Rerun it. Ah, okay, great. Why did this fail? Yeah, because RAX is uh, 64 bits, so I'm trying to move eight bits into a 64 bit register. Uh, there could be junk in RAX, so how how can I clear RAX first? Move zero uh, into RAX. Move zero into RAX. Now I know RAX is zero. Now I'm just gonna move, which byte do I want to move DL into? AH or AL? AL, what if I moved it into AH? Why is that wrong? It's the upper eight bits. And then it will look and say, that's like saying is 10 the same value as 10, uh, as a thousand, right? It's just the 10 moved over two decimal places. Like, no, it's a completely different number just because the digits are the same. They're in the wrong place, right? Uh, exactly. So we want to move this into the lower bits. Let's try it. All right. Is this good? Do we get the flag? No. Do we expect to get the flag? Also no, but did we do what we wanted to? Yeah. Why? We passed the RAX check. Now, to double check this, how can we absolutely be confident that the right value is in RAX? Int three, go. We can add a debug statement, right, to show us. This will show us the values in the registers and we can confirm with our eyeballs that RAX correctly has the lower eight bits of RDI. All right, we got the, the, the thing here. So RAX is AC. Let's look, we didn't change RDI. So RDI here is uh, DDAC. So we have successfully changed the lower eight bits of RAX to AC. And we've successfully done our modulo operator. So if we're going forward, 
And now we need to set our BX to RSI. Do we do the exact same thing? No, I see some head shaking. Why not? Because it's a different modulo number. So we would do the same thing again, figure that out, and go forwards, which is, I think, all I'm going to do here. Cool? All right. Oh, shoot, I said 20 minutes, but I wasn't keeping track. OK, five-minute approach on one other level. 19. Oh, that was slightly unanimous. Did you guys plan that? Nineteen. Oh, nineteen's a fun one. All right. All right, Emacs, and we want a shell to look at some stuff. Run the challenge. Okay, read the challenge, so it's not just running it, right? Okay, normal instructions. In this level, we'll be working with control flow manipulations. Great. What should we be thinking about with control flow manipulations? What instruction? All together now. Jump, thank you. Yes, we should be thinking jumps. This involves using instructions to both indirectly and directly control the special register RIP, the instruction pointer. We'll use instructions like jump, call, compare to implement the requested behavior. All right, we're testing multiple times with dynamic values. Okay, great. Wait, did I, uh, what just happened there? Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm uh, getting familiar with this. Okay, the last set of jump tables is the, wait, what? Okay, what's going on? Okay. There we go. Is this just cut off normally? Seems bad. Nobody's yeah. mentioned this? I think I'm set a few places. Yeah? Okay, well let us let me know. I can fix it. Shouldn't be like this. Alright. Maybe that's the key is right after here. Okay. Last set of jump types is the indirect jump, which is often used for switch statements in the real world. Switch statements are a special case of if statements that only use numbers to determine where the control flow will go. Here is an example. Switch number. So if number is zero, so we've seen switch statements, C, C++, and Java all have these. Uh, I think Python, uh, does new version of Python have them? Switch statements? Case statements, kind of the same. Okay, so switch on a number. If it's zero, then jump to z do thing zero. If it's one, jump to do thing one. If it's two, jump to do thing two. Default, jump to the default. The switch in this example is working on number, which can either be zero, one, two. In the case that number is not one of those numbers, then default happens. Uh, so it's kind of an if else statement. We're using numbers. Um, so it's no surprise if we can make statements based on something being an exact number. In addition, if we know the range of numbers, take for instance the existence of a jump table. A jump table is a continuous, uh, contiguous section of memory that holds addresses of places to jump. In the above example, the jump table could look like this. So at this memory address, the address of do thing one, at this plus eight, the address of do thing one. How come this is eight bytes above the first address? What is eight bytes long? Memory. memory is very large. Memory can be terabytes large, but you're very close. Yes, the address of a memory location is a max eight bytes large. Yes, so that's why if it's an address, it has to be eight bytes. This was a double check, right? As you're, as you're reading this, 
you can ask yourself, does this make sense that this other thing is eight bytes after this other thing? So the next address, and what's the difference between these two addresses? Or these two memory locations? Yes. Eight bytes again. How come it's not two? It looks like it should be two. It's in hex, so we gotta be careful about that, right? So it's a hexadecimal, so this looks like 10, but in hex, 10 is what? 16, yeah, it's one of the easiest ones to memorize, right? Because every digit is 16, so one is to, uh, 16 to the zero, and the next digit decimal place of a one would be 16 to the one, and the next one would be 16 to the two, and so on. So anyways, that's just an easy thing you do. Then this uh, 18 address of do default thing, Using the jump table, we can greatly reduce the amount of compares we need. Now, all we need to check is if number is greater than two. If it is, then we can do jump to, jump to the last one. So this is checking the default case. Otherwise, jump at an indirect location, so not known at, at runtime. Depending on what the number is, jump to the jump table address plus the number times eight. All right. So the goal is implement the following logic. If RDI is zero, then jump to this location. If it's one, jump here. If it's two, jump here. If it's three, jump here. Otherwise, jump here. Okay. Assume RDI will not be negative, so we don't have to worry about negative numbers. Great. Uh, only use one compare instruction. What's that preventing us from doing? Comparing everything and just doing a big if-else statement. Right? So it's kind of actually forcing you to do what it's asking. Um, no more than three jumps. Uh, we'll provide you with the number to switch on in RDI. So RDI is gonna be the number in this case. And we'll provide you with the jump table base address in RSI. So the great thing is we don't even need to worry about the jump table. Um, it's going to give it to us here in RSI. So this would mean RSI would have at the start this memory location. And this should be, well, okay, I don't know my hex that well, but I assume, super weird that that's not on an eight byte boundary, but that's okay. Uh, I assume the difference between hex C and hex four is eight. It's probably right, yeah. So makes sense, these are consecutive memory addresses. Again, we know that a memory address is there, so it has to be eight bytes, so we can double check. And so these specific addresses here will change. So we should not hard code in these addresses. We should be using this jump table, okay. Cool. So we have that in here. Let me, oh, AS. Let's get that whole thing. Let's write. Why did you not copy? Oh, uh, that's not fun. It's the problem when the keyboard shortcut is exactly the same as your. Uh, okay. Okay, so we want to <sighs> Okay, can we grab that? I just want that command to run. I was waiting for my input, that's why I did that. Okay, now I'm gonna actually copy this into my desktop so that I can paste that. It should be exactly the same. Come on. Okay, should this work? Why not? Yeah, because it was literally was the wrong thing. Um, okay, so uh, it was the solution to the other level. So let's look back at what we need to do, switch on number. So I would say one thing I would actually do is, um, okay. 
what I would do here is, oh, I need to kill, that's right. I usually don't do the terminal here. Anyways, what I'd probably do is copy and paste this thing of what we actually need to do, which is technically down here. Um, okay, so number, so let's keep track. Number is RDI, jump. Jump table is in our SI. Yep, okay. And we'll need to implement this logic. So what's the first check I'm gonna wanna do? If it's greater than three, why? Yeah, so this is the default check. So the thing said I should do the default check. And the default check, so if it's assuming it's negative, the cases are it's either zero, it's one, it's two, it's three, or it's greater than three. And so if it's greater than three, we will jump to the last place in our jump table. So we would compare RDI with, what do I want to do, three? And I'd probably do, what's the, now this is where I'd go back because I definitely don't remember all of the instructions here for jump tables, but we have this handy dandy stuff here of the slides that I'd go back here. I would say, which lecture was that? Oh yeah, that was the last lecture. This was on control flow. So we could go looking around, oh, there we go. So we want to, we use three, so we want it to be greater than, right? We don't want it to be equal to. So jump greater than. JG, jump if greater than. Where do we want to jump to? So if I just did uh, RSI, so I jump if greater than RSI, where would that go to? That's the first one. Which one do we actually want? One, two, three, four, five, the fifth one. Uh, can I do five times eight? All right, invalid use of register. Type mismatch because I can't use that. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. There's a couple possibilities. Maybe I can't do the multiply. So what's five times eight? 40. Okay, another invalid use of registers. Yep, okay. That's what I figured. Okay, so I should be able to do this, right? Can I not do offsets of registers? No, so I need to compute something. Great, okay, so I need a temporary register. Move into RAX, RSI. So I'm gonna move whatever the address was into RAX. I'm then gonna add to RAX, what? 40. And then I'm gonna jump to RAX. Ah, but I will also, why do I need to move my compare down? I need it right before the jump, specifically because this addition will actually change the flags. So that'll mess things up. Okay. Wait, why is it saying that? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> we maybe will learn something new together. Okay, that jump worked. But Operand type mismatch. Okay. Mm 
jump if greater signed. Ooh, that's okay. That's a bad sign. Ah. So one thing is we're using a signed compares uh, jump if greater than, which is a bad sign. Why? Yeah, it's guaranteed to not be negative. Although I guess does that mean it won't have the highest bit set or it won't? Okay. But I can only use JG with a. That's interesting. Uh, X86 JG. Okay, this is where mm -hmm -hmm. towards the sign comparison. Okay, let's do this. So that doesn't work. So I think basically what I'm inferring from reading all this and from here is that to jump to an absolute location, we need a direct jump, right? Jump and operand. Whereas jumping to a label is an offset. So what I would do is then go back here and say, okay, so I can't jump to here that means I will need to jump to a label, something like that, default. And we can define that label. Where should default jump to? Yeah, what I did here. So I should move that down there because that doesn't really matter. So now I'm moving at an offset here. So this one takes a while to execute because it's doing like a thousand executions. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. What if this, what if it was not? So in the case that it's not greater than or equal to, or greater than three, then what do we want to have happen? Say it again. Jump equal to what? Yeah, but where do we want to jump? Right, so if we look back at the example, we could see if number is, in this example, if number is greater than two, then jump to that fixed location. Otherwise, jump to the jump table address plus the number times eight. So otherwise, so this is the case that we're in now. We want to jump to jump table address plus number times eight. So how do we know what's the number? What was it? It's RDI. So move into uh, RAX, let's say RDI. Now REX has it. What do we next then need to do with the number? Yeah, multiplying it by eight. So we could use, you've studied the multiply instruction. We can use the multiply instruction to multiply by eight, uh, but there's actually a better way to do it. <laughs> Powers of two multiplications, yeah. Bitwise shift. If you move because of the way binary works, if you shift the bits one bit to the left, that multiplies it by two. If you do that again, it's another times two multiplication. And is eight a power of two? How many powers of two? Three. So we can shift it left three times and that's the exact same thing as multiplying it by three or multiplying it by eight. And actually, if you, if you look 
at the decompilation of your C code, if you do something like multiply a, an integer by a value of uh, a power of two, it will use this trick and use bit shifts instead of actually doing multiplication. Cool. Okay, so what is it? SH. Which way do we want to shift? Left. Shift left, RAX three. So at this point, we should have multiplied it by eight. Now we want to add RAX to what? RSI. So we want to take, so RSI is the jump table address. So we want to take the jump table address, add it to the number times eight, store it in RAX, and then jump to it. Okay, let's see if we this last one failed. Ah, error fetch unmap. Cool. Okay, invalid memory access. All right. Cool. I was just talking to somebody about this. Okay. Uh, another thing I'd like to do. I like to do is to read the code here. Uh, kind of helps if there's any weirdness. So compare RDI to three, if it's greater than three. So one thing we did notice as we were doing this was that uh, the J JG may not be exactly what we want. That's a jump if greater signed. So let's make sure we do an unsigned. So jump if above, so JA. So let's change that to a JA uh, just because we thought, hey, maybe that is a problem. Okay, compare RDI to three. If it's above that, jump to 12. 12 here is move RSI, and RSI is the jump table into RAX. Ah, I see. Uh, add hex 28 to RAX, and then jump to RAX. Cool, so let's look at, so let's add an int three here. Before that call, I want to see what that value is that we're going to. Okay, did not did not uh, break there. Let's do here. All right, cool. So now we know where the, that value is. Okay, now we can look in here. So we're jumping to RAX, right? That was exactly what our code did. This is the value in RAX, uh, 4030A0. Let's go look at our code. 4043A0, that is completely wrong. Okay, so double checking everything. So RDI, so in this example, RDI is one. So let's go back up here. So if RDI is one, where should we be jumping to? 4030 FD, which is stored at 404065. Okay, so FD, 65, but we are going to the wrong place. So we're jumping to 4043A0. So, the question, of course, is why. And we actually have enough information here to debug this, so let's see. So RDI into RAX, so RDI is one. So after this, it's one, shift left three. Let's see, I can use my calculator here. I can say one, I can shift left one, two, three. So it's eight, which it should be. That's one times eight, everyone agree? It's eight, yes. Cool. Okay, add RSI to RAX and move into RAX. So RSI is this memory location here. Forty-three ninety-eight. Okay. 
Great, so now we can do that. So plus ah, okay. eight plus paste. It did not work. That's because I tried to copy it within Emacs, but I am without. Okay. 4043A0, what's the value in RAX? 4043A0. So what's the problem? The RSI is what? Say it again. The RSI register was given to us, so we have to assume that it's correct, right? So it's some value that was given to us. We didn't, what, that would be one thing is working backwards and saying, did we change it at all? But we can see from here to here, we didn't change it. And we even debugging it, we, we can see this RSI, we can see this RAX. If we go up, we can see here's an example table. So how do I read this example table? And on this example table, which, which value is given to us? When the thing, when it says that it'll provide you with the jump table base address in RSI, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's 10 different memory addresses here. Which one is it going to give us? Which one? The first one. The first one, the very first one, right? Because this is in, so this is saying in memory at address 404398, the eight bytes that are at that memory address will be the memory address of where to go reference. And then eight bytes after that will be another memory address. And then eight bytes after that one will be another memory address for 48, I guess, contiguous bytes. So when we say jump RAX, what are we doing here? Let's take something else. Let's walk through the code. This is our code. We all wrote this together. Notice how I'm distributing blame to you and not just on me. Good. Okay. So we said in this example, let's say we let's say the number is zero. And in this case, we know that so RDI will be zero and our SI will be this address right here, because this is what we're given, the start address of the jump table. So we compare it. Is zero above three? No. So we'll go to the next line, move RDI, which is zero into RAX. What happens when you shift to zero left three bits? Still zero, thank you. We add RSI to zero and sort into RAX. Remember RSI is this value here, 40405D. So what's that value gonna be? 40405D. And then we jump to 404.05d. So what does the CPU start doing? So the instruction pointer here was at, what's this, 40,011? What's the instruction pointer going to be after executing this? 4045d? What's at 4045D? Yeah, it's these in, these bytes will be in memory. And we actually know because we looked at Endian this exactly the way they'll be laid out. The right at this memory address of 5D will be 2D and then 30 and or 30 and then 40 and then 00 and then 00, which when you do a jump and it sets RIP to that address it attempts to start executing whatever code is at that memory location. So it's treating what is an address here as x86-64 code. What does this decode to as x86-64 code? I have absolutely no idea. 
Not what we want. Yes, exactly. Not what we want. What's the problem that we're missing here? We want to actually dereference RAX and jump to the memory address that RAX that is inside of RAX. Right? So if you think about it at the C level, we missed a pointer dereference. We're actually saying jump to a memory location. What we really want to do is jump to whatever is where this memory location points to. Everyone see the difference? Yeah. Does that mean we have to put the uh, brackets around the RAX uh, on the jump line? Yeah, so we could see if we could do that. So I'd say, hmm. We can do it two ways. We can do, I think we can do it like this. We'll test it. Uh, I don't know if you can do this on a jump operation. You definitely could with like a move. So let's try that. Hey, there's some output. Okay, something happened, but let's go back. There we go, keyboard interrupt. Uh, Cause I don't want all that debug output now. That's what's slowing everything down. Okay. And now that I know that we can, what? Oh, there was an N3 at the last one. That's right. Cool. How many jobs do I have? Okay. Get rid of this. Run it again. So do I expect that this works? Oh, you guys conned me out of uh, a lecture. Don't worry, we have 25 minutes still. It's all on assembly, so. Does so it just hang if it gets in an infinite loop? Yeah, I think it's in an infinite loop. I, I think this, uh, well, it just so happens that whatever, so. If you notice, we changed this one. We did not change this guy. And so whatever that instruction is, whatever instructions that it's executing here might be an infinite loop where it's just continuing to loop forever, uh, which I was hoping it would actually show us that it's wrong, uh, which is a great because I didn't want to solve this. Uh, I wanted you to solve this. So that's good. But now we can see that we definitely saw it together, right, that we were first crashing we couldn't even pass uh, any of the first test cases because this first condition was wrong. Now that we did this and made this change, now this can now that condition works, but now we're failing somewhere else. So we'd probably add some other debug things in threes to figure out where exactly we are. There's only one other place, the default condition that we need to look at. Cool. Questions? All right, let's go learn. All right, I am gonna not do these slides. We are gonna switch over to Connor's slides. Okay, so what we're gonna do is be putting, so you're learning x86-64 assembly, you've learned how to move data around, move it in and out of memory, you've learned how to compute on that data, you've learned how to branch based on that data. Um, but how do you get it to actually do stuff? 
it's kind of like a philosophical question, right? If data exists in a CPU register or some computation happened on a CPU register, does it actually make an impact or a sound? So we want to build, we want to use assembly to do things. And that's why we're, we're now marrying. So what you first learned about in the first module was how does HTTP work? from the client's perspective. Then what you're gonna be doing in the next module, and then you learned assembly, now what you're gonna be doing is actually building a web server, something that understands HTTP, using assembly from the other side. But to get there, we need to actually be able to talk to the real world. So another kind of representation of what we've been doing uh, with the layout of x86-64 code here, the memory locations here. So again, this is what we were talking about, right? Uh, at this memory address, there are these bytes. I would assume these are eight. So yeah, 0, 8, 10, 0, 8, 10 is another way to look. These are all hex. Even without the 0x, I think we can all see that these are hex. Um, all the registers that we care about and are important, RAX, BX, uh, RIP. Cool, okay, first instruction, move the bytes, one, three, three, seven into RAX. And then after that instruction, so the RIP is updated to the next instruction. RAX is then set to this value. This is again, just a uh, catch up for what you already know because you've been studying this. Then move this long memory address into RBX. So now after this instruction executes, RIP register will be updated to the next instruction. And RBX will now have this hex value in here. We then wanna move RAX to so what does this, somebody remind us what this brackets are around B, RBX, what does this mean? As an address. So write out the eight bytes at RAX, store them in memory at the memory address of whatever's in RBX. We know exactly what RBX is. It is uh, 4000, which is here at the top. Sorry, I couldn't uh, spot that. Which is here at the top. So we should go through it and say, okay, what's the, what are the bytes going to be there? And we also know because of the way insane the little Indianness is, the littlest byte is written first. So the, actually in memory here, we have 37130000. Whereas in the register, we had the value 0000, and then hex 13, and then hex 37. Then we can uh, do things like add 42 to RAX. So now the value inside RAX is 1379. And then push RAX. So that will change. So how do we know, how do we know a push RAX? So push RAX will change some memory. How do we know what memory? The stack pointer, RSP, RSP tells us. So the stack pointer is currently pointing here at 10. So push RAX will decrement the stack pointer by eight bytes. So it'll point to 008 and then write the value there. So our value will now be at FE008 right here where it's in red. And again, because a little Indian, the bytes will be in memory 39.13.000. Cool, right? This is all the stuff you've known. You can all do this. Awesome. But now we want to actually, so yes, to my philosophical question, but if you can't actually see any of these registers or anything in memory, who cares, right? We gave you the ability, uh, this level is kind of special of this assembly module because you can have that int three that allows you and dumps out some memory, but normally you don't have that. You have to actually get your programs to do stuff. So this is where hardware comes in. So we have our CPU, we want our CPU and our programs to be able to do things like send data through the router, send a packet out, print this on the user's screen, which is a physical thing, uh, print something. And so if we wanted to do this, the hardware actually tells us no. So if you don't know, this is Linus, the guy who created Linux. Um, so this is the, the entire purpose of an operating system is to prevent you from talking to the hardware directly. Why? Otherwise, hacking would be too easy. Yes, in some sense, security 
right? So if you think about there's um, there's different types of SSD of uh, hard drives. Anybody have like a spinning disk hard drive in a desktop machine? No, nobody has that anymore. One person? Yeah, two people. Yeah, you can have literally like 18 terabytes on a drive. You can have a super fast two terabyte SSD drive. You can have a um, uh, like an SD card that has 256 gigs on it. Um, how, how to actually talk to that physical hardware drive to get it to store the bytes you want is different depending on the device and maybe different depending on the device manufacturer in crazy cases. And the idea is the operating system should be handling that for you. So it's actually a nice abstraction layer so that you can just tell the operating system, store this data to this file. And then the operating system goes, great. What device is this file, this location tied to? Is it a hard drive? Is it an SSD? Is it this thing? And then it will figure that out. So this is why you're not allowed to touch things directly. Uh, it also gets into like then if you have multiple programs, let's say they all wanted to write files directly to a hard drive at once, who wins, right? So that's why you need the operating system to act as the mediator there. So this is... Uh, exactly the purpose is we need the operating system to do stuff and to do everything for us. It, it is not just talking to files, it's sending packets out on the network, it's talking to USB devices, it's literally printing out to you. So whenever you see something on the console, the program had to ask the operating system, print this to the user. If the program does not do that, it again just stays in the memory of process of the program and does nothing. So this is where there's a special instruction called a syscall. So uh, you can think of it as a system call. I guess it would be you're calling into the operating system. And this is the way for your x86-64 program to say, hey, do something, please, operating system. Now, it's just a single instruction called a syscall. So you have to have a way of telling the operating system what you want. Do you want to? write to a file? Do you want to read from a file? Do you want to quit and stop executing? You actually have to ask the operating system, yo, I'm done, like, please stop me. Um, and so we'll get into, there's a specific calling convention, just like we saw with uh, when you're calling functions in a program, calling into the operating system kernel uh, is exactly another type of calling convention. In this case, I believe it's RAX that's used to specify the exact one. What's a 42, Connor? It's a nice number, and it's connects. Okay, it's not something you just use on its own. I hope it was like exit or something, or a, a no argument, syscall. Anyways. No, because we're talking about the router, it's connects. It's good, okay, great. So we have 42 into RAX, we call syscall, and then the operating system will read the, the values in registers and figure out what we actually wanted to do. So in this case, we can ask the operating system, hey, do something, and then it can go from our CPU to the actual physical hardware, like in a router, and make it do things like blink, if that's like something that it's, your hardware can do. Um, and that is where we're going. So to do that, we need to understand how, um, processes work and other types of programs. So we're going to go in and learn a little bit more about how the operating system manages all of this um, by going through and understanding different system calls. This is the or correct order, right? Yeah. Okay. I didn't check the um, number. So very important system call is read. So the read system call will so we'll talk about fds or file descriptors basically this is a very uh, special number that the operating system gives you um, and then you can give it back and says hey read from this file descriptor count number of bytes into this memory location into buff and so depending on what the file descriptor actually is if it's the hard drive it will if it's a file on a hard drive, it will do all the dirty work of talking to the hard drive. Um, if it's a, I think, can you use read on a, uh, on a network connection? Maybe, mm -hmm. depending, is it only a stream based though? Yes, uh, it could be a 
You could be reading from a file. You could be reading from a network connection. Um, and so depending on the semantics of the operating system, it also may hang because you may ask for some data and the operating system goes, great, I will give you back. I, I, if there's no data available, I'll wait for it. If it's your hard drive, your hard drive needs to spin and figure out the exact place um, that everything goes. Other ones, so there's the analog. So it, it kind of, um, I always have to re-examine what these uh, functions actually mean in my mind. When you're reading, you're reading from something like a file or, oh, the other way that you read and write is from the user. So standard input, standard out output, like we've been talking about. Uh, so you can read from standard input. So a read reads from a data source and writes it to your program's memory. So this is the important thing to keep in mind. A read actually writes to your memory and changes your process of memory. Where does it change? Yeah, whatever the address is that's in the buff variable. And we have the reverse. So we may want to write to a file. And writing to a file reads from our memory. So write says, write to this file descriptor at the address located in the variable buff, count number of bytes. This is all you literally need to do to read and write files. And the other important thing, what we're talking about here is literally at the, the operating system layer. So you may have used other things to output data like printf, anybody used printf before? Right, handy dandy, very nice. You do not need to specify when you use printf how many bytes you want to write because printf is in a library and the library handles everything, does it, and then calls write for you. So it's a wrapper or an abstraction layer on top of the underlying file system concepts. But we want to actually get files. How do we get a file descriptor? Uh, we'll see there's actually three special file descriptors that are passed to your program, standard input, standard output, standard error. Uh, these are some things that I don't think we'll talk about right here, but definitely memorize that like standard input is uh, file descriptor zero, standard Output is file descriptor one, and standard error is file descriptor two on all Unix -y systems, let's say, because I don't know how general that is. Uh, and we can also ask the operating system to create a file for us. So this is the open system call, opens the file. So you pass, specify a string as the path. And again, this is an address in memory. So it's some bytes in memory that how does uh, the operating system know when it's reached the end of a string or any C program? A zero byte. Yeah, so strings in C and in the operating system are terminated by a null byte, so zero. So it will try to open up that. Um, you can specify different flags of different things to do. Uh, you can specify, yeah, so oCreate is, will create a file if it doesn't exist. Uh, mode will be what kind of mode you're, do you wanna read the file, write the file, um, read or, and write the file. And what it returns is an integer, which is the file descriptor that you can then pass to read and write system calls to do stuff. And with these three things, you can open any file, read it, and write it, and now boom, your program, the x86 assembly code you're writing, can now talk to the file system. Uh, yeah. So to manage, oh, what is a file descriptor? Great, that's glad you asked. Uh, to your program, it's literally nothing but a number. So you can see the type here, if you think of it in terms of types, as an integer, the int that is returned by open is exactly a file descriptor. What it means actually doesn't matter to you, it only matters to the operating system. As we'll see, the operating system keeps track of what files you ask and it maps, oh, file descriptor five for your program means this file on disk. Whereas another process may have the exact same file descriptor number, but it means something completely different. Uh, the other crazy thing is you can use the shell, you can, when you execute a program, you can change all kinds of stuff about file descriptors, and, and there's a lot of complexity there that you can do. 
so if we actually like dig into the file, uh, into the operating system to see what's going on under the hood, in Linux, every process that's executing has this data structure. You don't need to memorize this. The point is that it's there because if you just like start learning, oh, okay, open, read, write, file descriptors, they become these really opaque processes or a process, but you should understand what's actually happening under the hood of why these things actually exist. So here we have some task structure. Uh, this is actually like a C struct that you can go look at all of the definitions here. Here we've abstracted it out. So a process has uh, a PID, so the process identifier, this should be a unique number on the system that identifies that process. Um, PPID is I believe the parent ID, the real user ID, effective ID, user ID, save user ID. When we come back to access control, we'll study this more, but this is basically what user on the system, who's running this process, is root, the admin running this, is it a normal user? And then the thing that we care about here right now is the file descriptor table. So this is showing file descriptors zero through 1024 and the operating system, when your process first loads, if you're running it from the terminal. So this dev PTS is, I believe, a pseudo terminal. Is that what the PTS is? Uh, it, it just means the users like is at a terminal and interfacing with it. When you do things like use the pipe operator or we show, showed when you do uh, like slash command or slash challenge slash run and then use the angle bracket to say give it some file like we did that with uh, an assembly file. What this actually does is the operating system runs it and changes, let's see, standard input as zero to be that file. So it actually reads from that file. But for the, our purposes right now, we just have to know that there is data that the operating system stores about which file descriptor matches to a specific, uh, to an actual underlying file. And that information has to be there so the operating system can act on our behalf. Um, cool, okay. So when we do an open call, so question, how do we know how to do an open call? And this gets into the calling convention, uh, x86-64 syscall. We'll have links to these. Uh, I like Ryan Chapman has a great uh, system call table. Uh, Connor prefers a different one, and that's OK. But so the way to use this table is, so like we said, RAX is the register that tells the operating system which of all of these, if you've never looked at this before, Linux has uh, over 300 different system calls uh, that you can call. You will not need to memorize or know all 300 of these. It's okay. But, so, so the way to read this is what do I put in RAX? Depends on which system call you want. If you want to call read, it needs to be zero. If you want to call write, it needs to be one. If you want to call open, it should be two close three and these are actually if you look at it, that's kind of nice the things that we talked about are literally well we didn't talk about close but it's the opposite of open then these are the registers that you put in the arguments so we saw that literally so if we go back to the slides if we go back to the slides if we go back to the slides there we go uh, so if we went to open and we go back to here Open takes a character pointer path name, an int flags, and a mode. And if we go back to the syscall table, we'd say open takes a file name. So that pointer to some file name that we want to, to the bytes of the file name needs to be in RDI. The flags are in RSI, and the mode is in RDX. And that's how we look this up. So we say, okay, if we wanted to call open, give it a specific file name, we would first figure out where the bytes are, like how to, we would get the bytes of our file name into memory. We'd put that memory location into RDI, flags into RSI, mode into RDI, RDI, or sorry, RDX, and then two into RAX, and then call a syscall. That's it. So we can look at an example of this. So here we have in memory, 
we are doing a syscall. We can work backwards a little bit to figure out what syscall this is. So this is, so at the top here is the C code. So we want to call the open syscall. We want to open the file slash flag. We want to pass in a flag O read only and the mode is zero. How do we figure out what this O read only means? We read the documentation, he said, answering his own question. So one thing to know is that all syscalls in the man page are in section, what they call section two. So I think if you just did open, oh, you'll get that. But if you did read, if you did man, what? Okay, there we go, write. So if I do man write, this parentheses one means section one, which is, I believe, has to do with bash and the shell itself. Um, so this write allows us to write messages to another user, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the system call. So I would do man to write, and I would get the entire thing. You'll see that this, uh, this function signature is exactly the same as the what we showed in the slides. We are interested in open. We were using open, path name, flags, mode. So we, is Les not here now? It is, but you just said page in Les. Just like a normal Linux distribution that I've literally never had to do that before. Uh, OK. Oh, there we go. OK. So we were interested in flags. The open system call opens the file specified by path name. If the file name does not exist, it may optionally, if O create is specified in flags, be created by open. Uh, da, 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 there we go. The argument flags must include one of the following access modes. O read only, O write only, or O read write. Uh, these requests opening the file in read only, write only, read write. So this then the operating system is doing the permissions. And if we open a file, for read only, and we try to write to it, the operating system will tell us, no, you can't write to this file. We can open a file for reading only, where we can't, for, for writing, where we can't actually read to it. Um, so that's where we can find that in here. So let's walk through this. So our assembly code is first going to move this 4,000 into RDI. It, so that's in that register. It will move this value into RAX. It's then going to move RAX and write it into RDI. So which byte in this value is going to be the most significant, or is going to be written at exactly this memory location with the endianness here? 2F, which is what in ASCII? I know it because I do this stuff a lot, but this is like one of the things that actually comes up a lot. 2F. It's a slash, which kind of makes sense. We're opening a file, slash. If you had to put money on it, what'd you say 6-6 six, six is? F, 6-C, L, 6-1, A, 6-7, G, and the zero is the null byte. Let's see if we are correct. So if we're correct, then after this instruction executes, at this memory location of 54, which should be up here. We should see slash FLAG, and this on the right is showing us the ASCII values of these bytes. Move zero into RSI, move zero into RDX. So it turns out O read only is zero. We'll show how to actually look that up later. And then we move two into RAX. Why are we moving two into RAX? because it's, that's what the syscall table told us. So open corresponds to two. We will call syscall, and then that goes into the operating system. The operating system will then, with our process, 
read the bytes that we pass in for the first, the memory address here. It will read it actually from our process, which is kind of cool. And it will say, oh, slash FLAG is what they're trying to execute. And it will return three as the file descriptor in this example. Um, and so after that, yeah, that's actually seen here. So after the syscall, right? So the operating system does some complex stuff. Then it goes back and, and, and uh, our program resumes control. And now RAX has the value of three, which is the file descriptor that the operating system wants us to use. So this is part of the um, syscall, uh, the syscall calling convention is it puts the return value in RAX that we can then use. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, look at all them system calls. And this is how we can get stuff done. All right, thank you. Sorry I went late.